<laughs> Welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so I'm good. I'm, I'm really, really enjoying the, not really enjoying, I'm enjoying the internal process of the coronavirus. Mm. Um, like, I don't know what day you're on now. Is it 16 or 17 or something? I don't know. Mm. Um, but from the start, I knew that I wanted to have a little bit of time of reflection. Um, so we've, we've made some plans of the little schedule that, I'm gonna, that we're going to do, you know, a few little cleaning exercises, as in yogic cleaning exercises. And just dive into the practice a bit, treat it a little ashram mm. style for, for, for a little bit, you know, because it's such a brilliant opportunity to do so. We've all yeah. stopped. We've all stopped. And we can, you know. So, yeah. Now, are you enjoying the silence? Yeah, mate, I am. And, like, um, yeah, it's just one of those times when we're not going to get this time back. And it's, like, it's a really important time for reflection and just, like, quiet and really thinking about, you know, we spoke about it, like, what's next and... Um, actually, what is it all about? You know, <laughs> like let's be, let's think about actually what you can almost map your life out. You know, in a, to a certain extent, like the next good few years for sure. Anyway, definitely, hundred um, percent. So it's like, are you doing things right? Are you sort of congruent with what you really want to be doing? Um, so yeah, no, it's it's really good, and I'm obviously cracking on with my, as I said to you, my coaching course, which is really good to have time to do that. Um, learning how to like be in the garden and you know we'll talk a bit more about it like the soil and like the light like, I love it like it's just so good but yeah just get off social media like um, that has been massive for me how, how has that had an impact for you then the social media part <clears throat> on a physical level though Josh it's kind of um, because mentally you're always checking, right? You always check. You've got something there that's like always. You always check. Oh, you know, is that person seeing that, or should I do this? So I haven't got any of that now. It's literally just that's all. Like so, my my kind of productivity is like gone up tenfold. Yeah. Like on myself, and um, I haven't got like any no no anxiety at all about it. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I've done it before. Like it's always good. Mm. How how do you like? Obviously, so I don't know. I haven't even looked to see if uh, food by John Lawson's active on Instagram. Is the no. restaurant Instagram active? No. So like, how how do you feel like in the future when like say for example that you end this you, you end this uh, coronavirus period and you're like you, you've loved the whole no social media game. How, how do you feel about that, like, going forward for the business? Because that's one thing, obviously, that worries me a lot. Is like the, I guess that's where my anxiety stems from, in a way. Is like I, feel, I feel like I have to be on Instagram because otherwise, you know, it's bad for the yoga factory. Mm. Yeah, I guess um, it's probably a little bit different, your business and my dis business. But in terms of, I did think about that, in terms of, obviously, like, we're closed now. So, essentially, all I can offer my guests is um maybe a bit of noise about what i'm doing yeah but like actually is that going to make them they're still going to come in and eat when we finish yeah so um once all this is done like yeah whatever happens once all this is done um i think potentially it could be we could be a lot busier than we were yeah i think so because but, just because of the message as well more than anything you know, your message and, and your ethos, I think, would be a big contributor to that. Yeah. So uh, I'm not I'm not bothered about that at all, really. I'm just really kind of like thinking about when we do return, like how we're going to do it differently and how my role is going to be in the business. Um, you know, all those things are really like I'm just processing now, which is good. Yeah, yeah good. So, well, yeah. we've had some people join us, which is nice for them to listen in live. Oh, we've cool. Got Brian Gray's and, and Rosie. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so now, now I feel like we should do a formal introduction to the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, for, for those listening at home, for those um, tuning in live, uh, 
John and I are sitting down um, to talk a little bit about everything, really, but, you know, basing it around food, of course, two things, uh, John, well, things, something that John is very passionate about and has based his whole life around and something that I'm quite passionate about. Um, so it'd be nice to have an co open conversation about about that and, and maybe the environment we're in now and how that has impacted it. So, yeah, welcome. Um, I don't really feel like you need much of an introduction, John, but, you know, <laughs> um, we've sat down before, but John is a local uh, restaurant owner, um, has been in the game for a long time now, um, is a brilliant chef, worked with some greats, and is now venturing on a, a good, if you don't mind me saying, a, a, I think a fulfilling personal journey in a way, isn't it? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. And studying again. Yeah, nice to study, eh? How is that? Studying again? Or well, studying? <laughs> yeah, stud doing this course. So yeah, the health coaching course. I mean, it's, um, it's just something I love, Josh, really. Mm. So I think when you do something you love, like I've done all my life anyway, cooking, and it's not really, um, it's studying, but you're kind of like really into it and excited about it. So uh, I guess the modules and like the assignment work is quite full on so i do need to focus on it and making sure it's not just like reading a few books and then um writing about it you've got to be very specific and mm. you know certain modules are obviously revolved around different um subjects within coaching but yeah i'm really enjoying it like learning about how to be you know an effective coach yeah so it's um it's all like part of kind of part of um my philosophy anyway right so yeah definitely and i'm guessing that some of the stuff food related is quite common to you but the coaching side of things are they do they teach you actually like how to you know the mechanisms of coaching and and like what coaching means and how to coach i guess right mm, yeah i mean there's a whole thing about coaching it's like um this is such a good course because it teaches you how to listen um, like active listening, not just like, you know, like casually listening when you're in a conversation with your mates, but actually yeah. active listening. And it teaches you the importance of that when you've got a client and one on one it teaches you about building rapport with people. So it's very much life skill based, um, the section I'm on now. And then, um, you know, in a few modules time, it goes into more of the nutrition. So it's such a good course, like for life, you know, anyone, it's good for anyone. Yeah, yeah, and I think things like that, like that are coaching, coaching related, whether that's food, whether that's business, whether that's you know anything like that. I think it's for the personal development, it's amazing. Oh. Like my my business coach, he he's been a he he was a CEO and blah blah. He done all of this, and then he left the company to become a business coach because he wanted to help people, wanted to help people of all size businesses. Mm. And now he's been doing that for fifteen years, and he's actually gone back to work. And it was by a little bit of fluke, he said, but he, he, he was excited for the challenge of going back to work in a company to see what skills he could transfer from the coaching to putting that back into a company again. And I find that fascinating that he's, he's a business coach, but he's willing to take that time out to reinvest it into you know, working again and to seeing how he can transfer those skills over what he's been preaching for 15 years, see if he can actively actually still do that and what impact that would have on the business and his own personal development. So thought that was really modest of him and really cool mm. um, so that was that's was refreshing to hear someone of you know who's been doing that for so many years and how he's taken coaching to the level of actually going back in and doing it for himself so that's cool yeah he probably wants to learn more right he probably wants to you know you just become obsessed with learning and i think that's like yeah i'm a bit i'm on that journey now just wanting to learn more and more and you know um you're the same josh you know you love learn i think that's just you know it's just it keeps you going through life as well, right? So yeah, good. I feel like it's a natural, it's something natural for us to learn, to want to progress, to develop, to evolve. Um, we're, we're innate. I, re, I was watching something, we was watching something really cool about, have uh, you ever heard of Satguru? Uh, this guy, he's on the internet, Satguru. He's, he, he runs oh, yeah. the Isha yeah. Foundation. You know, he wears the turban and that. And the yeah. Lectures, yeah. <clears throat> he said something really wonderful about evolution, about the human species. And he was saying about, you know, how we're very much a dominant species, species 
species, whatever you call it, um, on this planet, we are the most dominant. We, mm. we're, we're at the top of the kingdom, right? Um, but we constantly want to evolve. If you're given, you know, enlightenment, for example, you know, so you've conquered this physical earth, you've gone beyond this physical earth, beyond this physical plane, beyond this physical body, what's next for you? You're going to want to conquer the stars. You're going to look up in the sky and think, I'm going to want to conquer the stars. You conquer the stars, what are you going to want to do? You're going to want to conquer the universe. And it goes on and on and on. We're mm. constantly evolving as humans. We want to evolve. That's our nature, you know? Mm. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's within us and I think it's a native in us to want to progress and want to evolve. And that is part of what the yoga scriptures are all about in a way is evolution is mm. re- If you believe in reincarnation, well, the principle of reincarnation is to reincarnate to become a better human each time or to become closer towards enlightenment or closer towards your truth. So I think as humans, we, we, we have to want to evolve. If we're not, we're stagnant. We're not going anywhere and we won't be open to so many opportunities. And I'm sure as you learn, and as we all learn, we realize that more opportunities come our way. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's interesting, isn't it? How the mind works of it. It's like, you know, always wanting to do and do, but like, as we were talking just before about actually it's nice to be as well. It's nice just to, you know, especially this time, just be and actually not do so much. Yeah, yeah. And well, again, quoting, quoting um, Satguru, it says it in our name, we're human beings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> being is part of us you know we've got to sit and be and 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 actually absorb this Very i feel important. like well i know we talked about it uh, before anyway before this podcast but i've felt like it, we have been on this one big steam train and we are not stopping <laughs> we are mm. going forward and we we're, 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 we've we've got the blinkers on and we're just thinking let's go forward you know and we don't think about our food we don't think about our exercise enough we don't think about our family and our loved ones enough we're just going on our own mission and this is a this is a universal thing living and being we've got a yeah we're, we're really starting to think about what's important in 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 life like deeply important and this has made that very like um yeah it's made it very real for people like actually what is we're all the same um you know as long as we've got food on the table and we've got sort of connection with with you know and and it's really hit home, isn't it? Like the importance of uh, food is just massive exercise, our health, general, uh, our general health and well-being. Um, it's really, it's really kind of, that's the big, that's the big thing I've got out of all of this. What are the important things for us to survive? Yeah, uh, definitely. I, I feel very lucky. I feel really lucky. And I was thinking about this the other day that I, I, I've lived in Nash. I've lived in a yoga ashram. I've lived a very simple life. And from that moment, I knew I wanted to live a simple life because I knew um, how that makes you feel, living a simple life, mm. open body and mind, what we're all most experiencing now. So I feel lucky for that experience. I slept, on a, I slept on a futon bed for about six months that was like this thin. And I had to fold it up every single morning and put it in the, in the storage. <laughs> and every single night I had to make my bed, you know. Uh, and just get it from the storage and wake up at six in the morning, put it back and same again at night. Well, no matter what time you go on, go on to bed in just a yoga hall, you know, cause there's no room in the bedrooms. So, oh. you know, I, I understand how beautiful it is to do a simple life. I'm grateful for having a bed now and a house, of course, and the ability to buy food. But mm. I, I also empathize for the people that don't live so much of a simple life right now, who most are experiencing some confusion. I said this on a podcast two days ago with someone else. And um, yeah, I think it hopefully teaches everyone that we can live simple with just food and exercise and people. Uh, it's yeah. a beautiful thing. And, and, and I'm, I'm also wondering, you know, what that will have, what the implications it will have on the mind. I think a lot of people think it will have a negative implication, this um, uh, isolation, but I'm not sure. Maybe it could come out positive as well. What do you think? Do you feel like we could come out positive? I'm a very positive person, Josh. I know. <laughs> and um yeah i really i really do think so i think there's a positive that comes out of everything obviously there's a lot of negative right now and what's going on but i can see um some serious positives coming out this long term in terms of exactly what you just said really in terms of like individuals and how they think of their you know they're probably thinking of it now right when they're in their houses and their families and what's important to them and actually, the longer it goes on, the more um, we're kind of habitual, 
humans, we are, you know, if it goes on for three, four months, actually people will start forming new habits. Mm. Um, you know, that's just uh, natural as human beings. We will gradually form a new habit. So the longer it goes on, actually, probably the better for people to start getting into new, their new, I guess, the new norm, I guess. Um, but yeah, hopefully people will start appreciating. Um, for me, I would like, what would I like to get out of this at the end of it is for people to start appreciating food and their health and their well-being and how they treat other people better. I think that is a big thing that's going to come out of this. What do you think the first step to appreciating food is then? And pre appreciating themselves, I think. Mm. You know, appreciating, appreciating their own body, their own mind, and how food has a massive uh, role to play in that. I think it's, you know, I think that's probably the first step. People don't, I, I think some people don't really understand still that, you know, what we eat, how we eat has a massive effect on physically and, um, and mentally, right? I don't think people really are completely understand understanding that, but I do see, and I do feel more and more people are going to want to know that. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, um, maybe you're more aware of it now than the food coaching course, but I feel like I, I was very naive. I said this on when I was doing, <laughs> I did a, I did a live, um, how to cook chapatis this morning on Instagram. Yeah. Instagram live on cooking chapatis. It was good. Yeah, I've done three. That's my third thing now. I did a, a kidgeri, um, nice. a chutney, that's, thank you, and, a, and chapatis today. It's just a bit of fun and it's cool, you know, um, yeah. just showing people simple yogi food. But um, I said it this morning that, where was I going with it? Oh, yeah. I'm quite, I feel like I was quite naive to the fact that people don't really know that what we consume is what we, what we are mentally and physically. I don't know why. I don't, I don't know. Maybe just because I've always been in a family who, who love food and appreciate food and value food, but it's real out there. <laughs> I can't imagine what some people are eating at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, bless some kids, please. I pray for them um, without being too horrible to some parents, but it's a, it's, I guess this is part of your mission always is how can we get, how can we get people to realize that value? I think, what you're doing with the course is mostly a big step towards that. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think it starts like um, as I was saying to you earlier. It does start on like you know where I guess where do we get our food from? You know, from a young age, you look at people in um, you know kids in Italy and France, and mm. they probably know a bit more about like you know what vegetable is what you know is what, and and they've seen it being grown. And from a young age, it starts. But our culture in the UK, we don't necessarily have that. And um, a lot of kids don't know what food is, like vegetables are, what they are, and um, what's in season or anything like that. So it does start from that. And um, that's a lot to do with our culture over, you know, over the millennia, really, like years. You know, our parents, my parents didn't educate me on food. Mm. I had to be curious and I went and studied that. Mm. so it has a lot to do with that i think josh in terms Definitely. of where does it come from yeah generational for sure like my parents haven't grown food and I, and, I, and my grandparents haven't grown food so that's already you know three generations that have never had that contact with the earth and understood the growing process and the process right. of, of of life of, of, a, of a you know food that we're putting on our plates yeah. so to reinstall that i think it's brilliant isn't it um, yeah. I know you're not on Insta. I know you're not on Instagram at the moment, but so many people are posting pictures of them planting. Mm. It's phenomenal. That's so positive that people are getting out there, you know. And, and even if it's just a few pots on their window, they're putting seeds in there and growing salads or whatever. Well, that that's a sign of growth as well, though, Josh. Right? Like we're yeah. talking about what we're going to get out of this afterwards. Well, I mean, we're grow we're growing. Like we're thinking about. We're growing plants, which is incredible, right? It's amazing. I went up to the, before we locked down, like literally a, one or two days, I went to Bon Vie on Lee Road there. And because we was like, all right, let's get some seeds anyway. I don't, didn't really want to order them from the internet because I, I like to try and keep it local. Sold out, nothing. They had no seeds. 
they had no type of uh, veg left to grow. They had completely sold out. And I thought that was brilliant. So many people had gone in there and bought some seeds to plant and there was nothing left. So I was yeah. really, really happy for that to have happened. So that, that was a pretty cool moment. Um, so maybe this is a good moment to just talk a little bit about what you've been doing in your garden then, John. <laughs> <laughs> and how, and what, the, what was the process behind that? I mean, I'm sure you understand that when this is over, you're going to have to look after that veg. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> Unless you're going to get one of the kitchen boys to do it. I'm not sure, but... <laughs> I'm thinking... <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, I've been, I've been sort of really curious about growing. For, like, obviously, I've cooked food for the last you know 20 years or whatever and um never really known how to grow it and you know just what we were just talking about josh really it's like you know how do i how do i grow a radish how do i grow a beetroot but not like just how do i grow it like how do i grow it so that beetroot that radish whatever you're growing has actually got all the nutrients and minerals we need as humans right mm -hmm. because a lot out there that is um organically grown or non-organically grown is not as um, depletant of minerals because of the soil so i've been geeking out on soil um, mm. that's what i've been doing so really looking at like the soil matter and life and how it sort of penetrates to the vegetable or the fruit and how important that has a play on uh, us as individuals and um so i've been really looking into that so um it's not it's not an easy process that's why like a lot of farms just grow vegetables with just g generic compost because you can mm. but we need as humans minerals to survive and the only way of getting minerals is through our plants or um you know through you know through animal manure and but that's how you get it it's through plants um essentially so yeah yeah just just another th uh, um, curiosity that i wanted to kind of learn about so just um so i'm at the stage where i'm like laying down the manure and it's not an easy start i'm digging it i'm digging it at a farm um about half an hour away so it's a process so um just to shed some light on that then so with the soil what what is required to maximize the minerals in in the food that you're growing in the veg that you're growing yeah, I mean, so you can do just a basic compost, right? So you can put like your compost into a pot, put your little, um, you know, herbs in or leaves in, however you want, whatever you want to plant. Or if you really want to go for, um, you know, really good nutrient and mineral based um, herbs, vegetables, whatever, then you really look at the soil in more depth. So I'm taking like um, a real rotten horse manure, like when it's right. really dark laying that down then compost on top so really thick and looking at um, my friend jack from jack's patch has been kind of mentoring me on it he um yeah he gets worms in there and seaweed and it's about getting as much life and um uh, i guess um yeah lots of uh, energy going into it life form so then you know the the flies come on and all that so there's there's so much life going on and um then that just essentially transforms the vegetables into um, a really tasty nutrient mineral based uh, plant that we can eat that we will get maximum benefit from mm. rather than something that hasn't been grown that way. Mm. What I mean? Yeah, hundred percent. So essentially it's not really about if it's organic or not. It's about the life force that you put into that soil. Into yeah. Yeah. That compost. Yeah. I mean, it needs to be organic as well, because otherwise you're just spraying that away, that life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I essentially, like, if I'm, say I've got, a, I don't know, my, my uh, potato skin here, and I'm forming a little bit of compost outside, I want to put it in my compost. But essentially, like, if that potato wasn't organic, then the compost wouldn't be organic. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, exactly. That's fine, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we don't need to be too... I'm a little bit, kind of, I'm a bit pedantic about it, but um, yeah, no, exactly. It's about the soil, the life and that. Um, so yeah, it's just an interesting project. It's a big one. I've kind of like, but um, hey. Yeah. When I saw <laughs> the size of it, I was like, whoa, that's nice. But that's, <laughs> that's not small yet at the moment. <laughs> I, um, I well, did I'm a, managing it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I uh, tried to, when I lived in Spain, I, 
did a oh, the name's gone from it. I just had it. Biodiverse garden. So I just dug the soil. So I, I obviously marked it out. That then I dug the soil from the outside, put it in the middle, and then I used hay as the top layer. Mm. So it was just hay. But then uh, I obviously did the sprouting in a greenhouse, and then I just uh, planted the the vegetable or leaf, whatever it was, into the hay. So it wasn't actually ever planted in directly directly into the soil. So what the idea of this was this bio diverse farming i think that's what it's called it's from a japanese farmer is that mm. the process regenerates through and you never actually dig the uh, produce out you never actually like you know uh take the whole root out you're regenerating that soil constantly by just taking that fruit or the veg away and then it regenerating with the root and everything inside that soil so then you're building more and more fertile soil that time after time um and what the technique did was was that i'm not a farmer and i'm not i'm not an expert but you planted things around the outside that repelled insects so mm. you had like your onion based stuff your garlic based stuff around the outside to repel the insects from coming into the middle where you had the more precious produce mm. um yeah. it's basically like um it's like permaculture, isn't it? It's like no yeah. dig, no dig perm, yeah, I'm doing here, it's like a no dig style. So you don't, you lay it and let it be. Exactly that, and that's what this kind of was. And, but the point I was getting at actually was that it's so beautiful to connect with the, the earth in that way. You learn so much from that. You know, you've got to feed it, it's like a baby, you know, you've got to water it, you've got to be there for it. You know, you've got to pay attention to that piece of land that you've suddenly acquired and <laughs> put in some effort into. Um, so it's yeah. fascinating so, process. So rewarding, and... isn't it? Sorry? So rewarding. Yeah, so rewarding. So rewarding. So it's, it's, it's a brilliant experience. Um, what was I going to say? We had, uh, you, you put about here about the, the farmers we harvest on your little notes that we were talking about. Yeah, so just talking about, I think um, we're talking about food, which we are, clearly. <laughs> um like respecting food so just just wanting to see, like that's where it starts right so uh, how we grow it you know so how we, how we're growing food which is uh we we've okay so that's that's the first thing we need to understand but then how are we harvesting it so we're respecting the food this is the i think this is the most important thing we're respecting food so if you're looking to start um eating well again or eating well for the first time then respecting food in every level so like how is it harvest like i guess mm. nowadays we just see um food in the supermarket and um you know we have no idea of how it's picked and the people that pick it and the farmers that spend their life like growing and the hard work that goes into it and we don't even we're not even conscious of the fact mm. that what they do you know so this is such an important step and these people especially now we're kind of like so we're grateful for them. <laughs> What's that? We're grateful for the farmers now. Yeah, like because all of a sudden, food there was a food shortage. Um, now we're kind of thinking, like as we were saying before, like we're slowed down, and now we're realizing the importance of food um, on every stage. So, yeah, just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Like in the restaurant, when we get our food in, you know, we I talked to the guys about making sure that we 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 look after that, um, you know, celeriac or um, celery or something that comes in like that has taken a lot of work and love to grow. Um, so yeah, I think it's important to talk about that. That's such a, that's such a, um, a key step. We don't, we don't waste food either because of that. Yeah. Well, I think that that's, it's, it's in hindsight, it's very obvious why we've come to that stage, isn't it? Because of, like you said, we go into a supermarket and we pick it up off the shelf. Not at one point during that process do we ever pay some gratitude towards the farmer that's taken the whole season to grow that little bit of celeriac or potato or no. you know, whatever. And but I, I also feel like that as, and this is, might be a little bit off topic, but I feel like that has also got a little bit to the packaging of food and the sure. way that is displayed. If something's wrapped in plastic, how do we 
comprehend in our minds that that's ever come from the earth. Exactly, Josh. It's impossible to think that. Like, if there's plastic wrapped around a bit of, um, you know, some tomatoes or some aubergines, like, how would you ever? How would a child ever comprehend that that came from the earth, from the soil? Impossible. No, it's like um, it's a product. Definitely. Product, like, um, you know, like a textbook, is, a book is, or it's, it's it's just been manufactured, right? Yeah, it's been picked up. It's like it's just gone through the conveyor belt. So I think one for me, like, I think it's really important. And you're fortunate, and I suspect your staff are fortunate to see this organic food coming from your suppliers, and you know, you teaching them about the respect of the food and how to treat it and how to preserve it. But I think the main thing for people sometimes, even if they're not growing veg, if they live in a flat and they can't grow veg, is to go to places where they sell veg that is, you know, directly from the earth or you know, mm. is on display without plastic, you know, and those sort of more gro green grocer type vibe, uh, even though, you know, arguably green grocers still put a lot of things in plastic, but you know, <laughs> you know what I'm getting at. <laughs> better, right? Much better. It's not much, much better. better for that connection. These guys, yeah. Maybe this is going to change. You know, I'm always quite positive about it. Maybe it's going to change now. Hopeful, I guess. It could, could, do you think that there could be more like farmers markets coming up and things like that? Would you like to see that? Would you like to see people like selling more things actively? Yeah, I'd love that. Like, I mean, I spent a long time in Melbourne and they do all of that. You know, a lot of these countries do this. And I think, you know, here in Lee, like in Leon C, like this farmers market, um, it's great potential for it to be more than what it is now. But yeah. we do a lot more than what some um towns villages do right so i think yeah i would love to see that i would love yeah. to see more of that and if something i would get involved, involved in for sure yeah. yeah definitely same it's something that's been on my mind a lot what what does the jack jack's patch guy does he do anything like that does he do sell any food like actively or does he just supply people he's going to start doing box schemes this year he told me yeah nice um people so should check him out right what is his instagram at jack's patch yeah, yeah, Jack's patch. Mm. Yeah, so he's he's pretty um he's he's pretty uh, active on there. He's a character. He's a good guy. We need to get him on a podcast. Yeah, yeah, I spoke to him about it actually about your podcast. I did. He's well up for it. Yeah, he's a good, really good guy. I got he's got so much passion. He's so um so into it. Like he just yeah, it's like when I talk to you, Josh. We just kind of like um yeah, it's just inspiring, you know, and you like minded people. Yeah, good, good. good. That's pleased. I'm pleased to hear that he's on, on that. And he's a young guy as well and inspiring for people. So definitely check him yeah, out. Young, if anyone's farmer, young farmer, right? Like, sure, yeah, it's well, new age. Yeah, it is. And who who grows up to say, you know, it's that cliche thing. What do you want to be when you're older? I've never heard anyone say, I want to be a farmer. You know, astronaut, scientist. But, you know, we need more farmers. Like, you're never going to be out of a job. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really good. He's doing some really good stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's good to have him around as well. Like, I learn a lot from him. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, respecting harvesting, incredibly important. What's the next step to harvesting then that we should respect? Yeah, I mean, uh, next thing, harvesting, is like, I guess we've got to look at um, uh, what we consume in. So, in terms of like, so we're buying, so like quant the quantity versus quality thing. Mm. Yeah, so looking at quality rather than quantity and spending so our budget is say 50 pound a week maybe eating less but going for more quality so that quality produce will definitely give us um the right amount of nutrients and minerals and goodness we need rather than buying quantity of stuff at a cheaper rate so if we're saying organic versus non-organic or local versus um, you know, mainstream, um, for sure, it's proven, um, you know, studies around it are based around the fact that organic local produce, because it's fresh as well, has a higher nutrient uh, mineral intake than, say, food that's been flown around the world. So we need to seriously look at this. Um, and this is a, such an important part that we're buying too much. We're food, we're eating too much. Mm. Um, we don't need to eat as much as what we're eating. Yeah. You know, I mean, you fast, Josh. I mean, it's just, it's crazy to think, you know, it's all in our minds. Yeah, it, it, 
it definitely is and again this is about the education of food once again and I, and that you're you're someone who's actively trying to do this as well and I, I don't know how to how you can like people can come to a yoga class right and you can tell them what to do for the hour whether they listen or not is a different story mm. it's gone in their subconsciously somehow mm. having these chats is so important because how often are we told that the quality of the food is better over the quantity we're so blindsided to that like completely we think that yeah eating more veg is going to make you more healthy eating more protein is going to make you more healthy blah 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 you see people who go to the gym and the amount they eat is incredible and i know they've got to supplement what they're doing on their output versus their input but you don't need that much food no. um Creating an education around that is, is, is again, one of, I think is one of these challenges. It's so amazing like, what we can get from a tiny mi- amount of food. And I think that comes down to the way we eat it as well and the way we prepare it. Mm. Like if we don't know how to, and this sounds stupid and I'm not trying to belittle anyone, but if we don't know how to consume that food as in how to properly eat, and that is not just putting it in our mouths, that is what you do before eating and after eating. Mm. I'm sure you understand this more than me is like before eating often we are, I feel this is my opinion and this is, this isn't anything to do with yogic diet or anything. Well, it is a little bit, but this is kind of my opinion, my experimentation with food is that what you do before and you after you eat is incredibly important to the digestive process and the gratitude towards that food. So say for example, before eating, we was running around, we was working, you know, you're, you're flat out, uh, you're working in the sympathetic nervous system, most probably not relaxed at all. When you sit down to eat, your digestive system is nowhere near going to be prepared to consume that food. Then you're going to eat it and it's either going to become, you know, congested and constipation most probably happens or it goes the other way and it floods straight out of you and goes out the other end. Mm. No nutritional value has been. You haven't absorbed all the goodness that you've eaten. No. At all, but if we were to take that five minutes before eating just to sit and be present with the food, you're not going to go hungry. <laughs> That's certain. Look at your food. This is what I think anyway. Look at your food a little bit, observe it, you know, observe the people around you if you're eating with people, and then you know, you know, pay some gratitude towards that food in whatever way that is for you. For me, that is, is a little prayer towards the food, and then eating. But then after eating, making sure you don't go and lay on the sofa and watch TV, you know even just five minutes of sitting cross-legged or sitting on a chair and socializing or clearing up or whatever it is. Just letting that process happen naturally, that digestion process and just in a calm way. Um, Also like just going back to what you said there, Josh, like when you're actually eating, like consciously, like you were talking about looking at the food, but when you're eating the food, actually like no music on, no distraction, just sitting there and actually like, chewing the food and like thinking about the food i know it sounds weird but it's something that i've done um recently in the last year where you know i tend to just i sit and eat and i think about what i'm eating how i'm chewing um the process it's an important process we've forgotten that we have some people uh we've we've we i'd never even had that when even when i was younger not so much we used to sit and quiet and eat i guess we did um but uh, it's so important. We're not just, you know, we're not just chucking loads of food down us. Yeah, because again, it becomes that object off the shelf. It becomes like a notepad that we just scribble down in. It doesn't become a valuable commodity towards our health. And, and, and we need it. We need it to get up in the morning. We need it to do our chores in the day. We need it to be able to, you know, work, all of those things. Um, mm-hmm. Without nutrition, we, 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 we're pretty, you know, depleted in prana and energy for sure. Uh, but yeah, definitely being, I love being present with the food and and like you said, it sounds weird, but you'll see the results, won't you instantly eating without music, eating without TV, those sort of things are unbelievable. Yeah. And you've got, you've got plenty of time for that. You know, your music and things like this, this is time to eat. It's an important part of the day. And I think it's, yeah, we, we've, we've underestimated that time, I think. Mm. Mm, definitely that's why i like the experience at your restaurant though actually because i don't know if it's you've consciously done that but i know it is a a tasting menu essentially but the space in between each dish is 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 perfect you know to digest the food not digest it but not wait too long because essentially we want to keep the 
digestive system going mm. a good rhythm don't we we don't just want to eat and then not eat it's like they say in yoga a lot of the time as soon as you eat something you activate the digestive system that means you're using the energy up again i know there's simple nutrition as well and it's talked about in nutrition as well but you know say for example i've eaten half hour ago i'm just gonna eat a nut now again i'm firing up my digestive system again you know yeah. there's no need for that so the pacing of eating is is important and that's what i like about the restaurant is that the pace is perfect it's not mm. too too long between each dish but it's not too um close together Close, yeah. And I think it's the right way for us, as you say, though, Josh, it's the right way for us to be eating, you know, um, little, um, little and more often. You know, that's the, you know, you're saying going back to basics, but I think we need to go back to basics in a way because little and more often is, um, you know, that's how we should be eating our food rather than three big meals a day. Um, we should be, you know, you know, having five or six meals, but um, just a little bit, just, just, just fueling. We're just fueling our bodies. That's what we're doing. Mm. Not having breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like, yes, they are the three main um, periods of food, but go a little bit lighter with them, and mm. have some fruit in between. You know, mm. so um, we're not shocking our system. We're not. We're not completely. Yeah. Um, I think that's really important to yeah. be doing this. Yeah. Hopefully we uh, learn from that. No music eat whilst eating, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no music. Can you yeah. imagine? <laughs> Babies. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so um, during the, um, the eating process is important, but I also think that um, that like once we've consumed food, like about what I was saying about the aftercare, I think that's just as important though like mm. whilst it's in our stomach we want to get the best from the food isn't it mm. um yeah yeah the assimilation okay. of the nutrients mm. well you're talking about like um i guess we're going on to there like uh what combinations of food you're eating together as well so the absorption that's what how, I, yes yeah how, how the body's best to absorb the food i think because some foods don't go well with others and, and that's very Ayurvedic as well, right? A lot of, um, it's big on that, isn't it? Like watermelon, yeah. you can't eat watermelon with anything. No, no, no. And um, I'm sure we can talk about this a bit more depth, but like, it's, for example, you mentioned fruit. is like, you know, not having fruit after your meal, like especially one of your main meals in the day, as in like a more cooked food meal. I think it's, it, from an Ayurvedic perspective, it's really bad to eat fruit after your main meal. That's what we say because it's mm. acidity. Mm. Um, kill like it starts to kind of almost um, hurt the the digestive system. Kind of kills mm. the the goodness from the food, so it can create acidity in the stomach. And is that all fruit, Josh? Is it? I'm not sure. I'll get back to you on that. But especially apples, oranges, melons, that sort of thing. For sure, pears. High acidity fruit, yeah. High acidity fruit, high sugar fruit. Often, high, high sugar, yeah. Often, uh, we would have things like that. Oh, dates is high sugar though. High acidity is what I'm talking. Yeah, and maybe you're right. I'm not an expert on this, so don't quote me. But I'm thinking that at the ashram, what we so typically what we'd have is more things like uh, yogurt with. Um, some sort of like nut I guess or like there would often be things like fried dates mm. things that are simple aren't they like just simple date afterwards or something yeah if you really have that sweet tooth simple date or yeah, I love you know, it like with a cup of tea at the end uh, <laughs> <bed> or something <laughs> have you ever had a date fried in ghee no you need to try that Fry some dates in ghee. Oh my gosh, that is the best thing. Like you could sweet thing you could have at night. A deep fry? No, not deep fry. Just a little bit of ghee. Yeah. Just fried on the pan. Right, I'll try that. Yeah, yeah, and split it open as well, so you get both sides nice and crispy. Right, I'm doing that one. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Fried dates. Oof. So good. But yeah, like you're right. Combinations of foods are really important. What, what from what you? From your perspective, then, what is good combination? So I've got my own ideals 
from my own experiences, but what would you say not to put with respect? Like what's highlighted in your mind not to put with one another? I don't know. It's something I'm learning about Josh, to be honest with you more okay. and more. Um, I just, I start like common sense, well, common sense to me, but um, I just always think like um, if I'm having kind of like fat, I'll try and have a bit of protein with it or I'll try and have a little bit of each kind of macronutrient um, together. I'm very conscious about the amount of protein I eat as well because we have too much protein that can turn into fat mm. and that's not good. So um, I guess I'm learning about what combinations – because uh, I'm not really good at that. Because I tend to like try and put too many things on one thing, like not a lot of it, but like different stuff. Like as a chef, you kind of like, oh, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Mm. I am just drawing it back a bit mm. to have like maybe three things on a plate. Mm. Um, yeah, and just going more simple in my food. I'm steaming a lot at the moment because it's um, mm. so good for us. Just to steam, like retains pretty much all the minerals. Um, like that's something if you like roast or if you boil or bake um, they just they just die off so if you steam it retains them and when you mean steam can you kind of just define that for a listener just 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 in basic terms like because obviously it can get a bit mixed up between boiling and steaming how are you steaming your veg basically <laughs> <laughs> uh, i've just got a simple steamer at home so a pot with water a steamer tray with holes oh, lid on um, all the other ways, like sometimes if you're cooking fish, so you just softly do it in a little bit of um, yeah, a little bit of ghee or whatever you, butter you want to use, um, or a good olive oil, like softly, don't fry it too much, softly, um, say if you're cooking um, a little bit of uh, cod or something, uh, or your vegetables, then you put a little bit of water in there with a lid on, um, because then um, we're not, as soon as we start roasting or baking or frying, then that's when we start um, going into like the, um, forget the name of it now, it's basically we start getting into carcinogens when it gets so high. Yes. And starts entering our body and not good for like lots of these diseases, cancer, diabetes, all these um, autoimmune diseases, very bad. Hmm. So, um, yeah, that's the next thing, isn't it? It's like how we're eating, how we're cooking, how we're cooking that food. Yeah. Definitely. I think, and that, and I think that's something that, uh, comes intuitively as well. I feel like intuitively I've always done what you've done. I've always steamed. Maybe that's because the way I've learned at the mm. ashram, but like we would never fry a vegetable. It would always be fry the spices, of course, to activate the spices. I'm talking about dried spices as in cumin, mustard seeds, etc., fennel. Mm. Then the veg would enter. But as soon as we entered the veg, and I still do this in my cooking now, I always put the water in and then I put the lid on. And that's it. I that's leave it. Way. Yeah. I leave it. I leave it there. I don't like it even to touch it. Because I like it to let it do its thing. Yeah. I have, I have a look at it, smell it a little bit, and you know, <laughs> taste it, of course, but, and add what I need to. But lid's on and I leave it. Yeah, so good. And also with that, though, Josh, like cooking food as well, like we should be... We should be eating about 60, you know, in this book I'm reading, uh, Optimum Nutrition, 60, 70 percent. Um, he says in there, 60 to 70 percent of our food should be raw. Yeah. You know, that's that's um, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. But in terms of if we've got the right enzymes and the right acid in our amount of acid, pH level in our gut to break that down. It's so beneficial because imagine like zero nutrients or minerals are being lost. So mm, yeah. you know, like eating a raw carrot or raw beetroot or something like that. So good. So even like apples, um, fruit you eat as part of a raw, that's all part of it as well, you know? So yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree with that. And <clears throat> this is where I'm not so clued up with regards to the Ayurvedic diet, but in Ayurveda, they talk a lot about boiling your uh, steam in your veg. Uh, steaming your fruit sorry so uh, sometimes they talk it, it's kind of controversial way because they say that similar to your book they say that 30 percent of your meal and i try and stick by this as i can 30 percent of your meal should be raw that's any meal and mm -hmm. i don't know what it says in the book but the raw food should be eaten first consumed first and then the cooked food consumed after so that the body can digest the raw food first then the then the cooked food yeah but then it says that fruits should be boiled. 
but then I thought maybe they lose their nutrition, steamed boiled, fruit should be steamed boiled. So it's, it's controversial in a way because they say that it's easier then to digest the fruit because the fruit, as we said, is quite acidic mm. when it's raw. So I'm not sure. I'm not an expert enough on nutrition. Hopefully you'll be able to tell me that eventually. But, you know, I mm. think that there must be a benefit in, in steaming fruit as well for the digestion. It must be. I don't know. They might be just talking about if they're, you're eating them together because obviously to yeah. the acidity maybe. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's just because of that. Then that, and then that works rather than, yes, those, again, sort of combinations of food again together, isn't it? So it works. But yeah, this is so complex, all of this stuff, you know. We're, um, we're not just eating food. No, we're not just eating food. It's not like just go and harvest all of the cucumbers and tomatoes out of the garden and eat them at once. It's like, what yeah. should you be eating those cucumbers and tomatoes with? Yeah, and I feel like in years to come, this they'll look back on us and be like, what are they doing? You know, like almost like, <laughs> because we've got so much to learn around our bodies and how, how and what we eat. Um, can really have a massive player in our to have optimum nutrition so we live a longer life and a longer healthy life like i think that could be um a massive player in the future you know definitely and hopefully bringing us back to to mother earth and our connection to that through food that's what yeah. i hope for yeah i'm i'm really hopeful of it and I think um, we're going to be closer to it after all of this. Closer for sure. I don't know how, you know, it'll be, there'll be more of a movement. Yeah. And obviously with, um, in the UK, obviously with Brexit, it will also help out, I think, with that. Let's hope so. We talked about this before, didn't we, on the last podcast we've done about the restaurant industry. You know, hopefully that encourages more restaurants to buy from the UK. And then hopefully that has a permeating, a permeating effect on the public. You know, where we, when we go to the supermarkets, hopefully more of that produce is from the UK as well. Um, because, you know, like we buy so much from abroad and restaurants do, right? Not yourself, but a lot of restaurants buy things like Chinese restaurants from abroad. <clears throat> and, and hopefully we can reduce that slightly because it'd be great to spread this, you know, uh, wealth between our nation in a way to then produce more food and have more, you know, <clears throat> food from our land and you know this part of the world yeah and i think also we need to make sure we've got enough farmers there knocking on the door like to be able to grow here you know it's people like jack uh people like sarah greens we've got more maybe you know more more people coming through that and land you know it's a tricky one because land is being used for houses and all this kind of thing we need to make sure we're respecting that industry more and allow them and giving them grants to be able to grow and to create this. We create this in the UK. We create a hub of, we don't need, you know, we want to get to a stage where we don't need food from anywhere else. But so, that, need, that needs a good leader to, to drive this, you know? Yeah. yeah, you need to get on centre stage, John. <laughs> uh, let's quickly talk about the mental effects then of food, because we've spoke well loads about the physical. Mm. Um, maybe we could enlighten a little bit uh, listeners on the mental, what we feel like the mental, positive mental effects of, are of eating more organic food and cleaner food and good food combinations. You know, like what, how, how for you has that changed your mindset or clarity or however you want to describe it? Eating cleaner and eating more efficiently uh, and eating right. Hmm. Yeah, it's been pretty big for me. I guess coming from a time when um, I didn't look after my body, you know, going back six, seven years ago, just eating, um, you know, exactly the opposite of what we were saying, you know, just eating for the sake of it and just to um, think I was fueling my body, but I wasn't. I was probably, well, I was poisoning it. I think, you know, go from that to now, how I am now in terms of how I eat how I look after my body and what that does to me on a, on a, um, yeah, on a mental, um, mental note is it gives me so much, it gives me so much joy and belief that things are, I'm doing things the right way. And, and I think there's so much to do with, it's so good in, on, on your brain and your mindset that if you believe you're doing things well, 
I know I'm eating the right things because I've read about it over many, many uh, journals. And there's that belief there. It gives me like incredible kind of like energy to know that I'm doing the right things. And that has a massive player in our uh, mind body relationship, like belief. Mm. Uh, we we've we don't know about that yet but that is a massive there's a lot of um uh research going into the belief system and how it's connected that we feel that if we feel that that's the right thing to be doing if we believe that then on the mind it's massive like so much clarity so much energy like um and positivity so yeah i believe like that that for me has been a lot to do with um has, has been massive in my recovery and how I am now. Mm. Mm. That's a nice relationship to have with food, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think it's just like, it's just, you know, you've really got to, you've got to be into it. You know, you've got to be, you've got, you've got to care about yourself. You know, <laughs> you've got to care about you as an individual and how you are. Um, you know, mentally interacting with others, wanting to be a better person. All of this is all connected, as you know, Josh. It's all, you know, part of the yogic philosophies as well. You know, it's about being, you know, every day being a better person. And and the food has a massive part to play in this. If we're not fueling our bodies with the right food, then we're kind of disrespecting ourselves. Mm, definitely. I think, um, uh, like like you said about this uh, in I relate that to what you I'm relating what you said to intention as well you know so like the intention that you put into creating that food will come out once you eat it and then that will uh, follow on to have a positive impact on your mind eventually oh yeah oh, oh did I lose you for a second yeah you did yeah oh, I was Sorry. in the moment <laughs> <laughs> um no i was kind of just saying about how uh what i'm relating what you said to the one i feel like the intention that we put into food when both being cooked or brought or eaten that intention then kind of carries on on our mind state following on from that so i Mm. think that it's almost like a intimate relationship with your partner. If you think or you put the correct intention into the food that you're eating, or if you're cooking it, cooking it, then that will follow on after your mind state for the following day or mm. the following two days. I think that's a really important thing to highlight with food is that yes, what you are, you eat as in physically and mentally, but like we were saying all along in throughout this whole podcast, but just to summarize that for me is like, if you put the intention into that food whilst cooking it and eating it, that will definitely reflect in your mind state following on from that. Mm, I feel yeah. strongly about that actually. Um, yeah. it's cooking with love, right? Cooking with love is, that is important, isn't it? Yeah. I tell my chefs all the time, like, is that, did you put your love into that? Could you taste it if they hadn't? Is that what you're saying? Could you taste if they haven't? <laughs> no, no, but it's like that whole, exactly what you're saying is like, have you done that with everything you've got, like all your heart in there? Like, did you want, did you taste it? And I think like what you said, Josh, is so important. Like it does transfer, transfer, transfers to my guests. Definitely. Uh, energies, the energy transfers. And um, it's a wonderful thing. Like when you've got that and you've, you know, I'm lucky I've got my chef Liam, he's got that, you know, he's, he, yeah. puts everything, he puts everything into it and it really shows, you know. Really shows and you can feel it, you can feel that when you eat it, you know. I remember the very start, I've said, told this story too many times, but at the very start of my cooking journey, cooking, because I'm definitely not a chef, but just cooking at the ashram, is that um, one of the swamis said to me, so a swami's a monk, swami said to me, Josh, you've got to cook today. I shit myself um because like you know this is like 25 people now in the building and i've got to cook for everyone and i've only been there like a couple of weeks and i've cardinal hardly assisted a lot of pressure 
unnecessary. I put unnecessary pressure on myself, of course. I knew she knew I was able to do it. I thought she wouldn't have asked me, but I, I, I knew I hadn't grasped the whole concept of cooking fully yet. But I knew I could. I had a rough idea. I assisted. I cooked all my life in here with my dad and stuff. So what I made sure of though was that I was putting the love into that food, or maybe subconsciously a little bit, but. I was doing my best, you know, I was doing my best to make that food good and the intention was good. Mm. And, and she ate it that night and she was like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. You know, it's really, really good. I'm not saying that because of my cooking. I'm saying that I think that is because of the intention that was put into the food. The intention mm. that was put into that bit of cooking, it reflected in the taste and it reflected in the mind state of the person eating it. Mm. From then on, she made me cook all the time. Um, <laughs> it was, then that was a thing, but... I still to this day believe that like the worst food that I've cooked is when I'm in the worst mind state. Mm. I think and, um, that is massive. I think also, um, yeah, no, exactly, Josh. And I think even like sometimes when I've in my early stages and still sometimes like I'll cook something, I'm like, oh, I'm not that happy with it, but I've done exactly what you said. Like I've tried my best. I've like made it look nice. And I've put everything I I know in that dish that I could have done. And generally people love it, but it's maybe not as good as like what I wanted it to be, but it doesn't matter. Like that has transferred like the here and now, like the present moment They're they're enjoying it. And I think, um, yeah, there's so much of that. We don't, we, we're not, we're not understanding it as much as we should be, you know, like it's yeah. not just about like, going to get a Mackey D's or something it's you know it's about the process and that um yeah that's why it's you know it's, it's, it's so important that um it's so important that process of eating yeah let's let's get I think that the next step now in schools is like Jamie Oliver done a I don't know what you think I've, he must have done a good ish job to get you know some of the crap out of schools but now it's like you know let's teach them that you know let's let's eat this food with good intention and <clears throat> learn how to make food with good intention it's about mindset mindset towards that food i think maybe you and i josh huh jamie oliver's <laughs> yeah that's it mate you're up well he's already out of business but you know <laughs> we can put him to shame <laughs> mindset and food in schools yeah yeah well, that is it that's right what you said though that is the next thing it's not just about it's um yeah no what we've spoken about you know sitting down eating before consciously yeah well, i remember in school like i would be like you know get this they had like you know with a slight different generation but um at king john we had like a little baguette thing and there was like a little pasta thing and there was little cooked thing but you know 90% of the people would go for the baguette or the pasta thing and be eating outside in the playground, standing up. Look, mm -hmm. I know kids are kids and, and youngsters are youngsters, but at the end of the day, like, this is where it starts, isn't it? You know, we, we need to learn this from early stage. And if we don't, then I think it's detrimental. So Yeah, yeah. even if it's two days a week or something where they're, they're consciously sitting there, they're, you know, they're not allowed out, whatever it is, there's oh. restrictions. And, and relating that to actually European countries, just quickly, is that when I lived in Spain, completely different ball game and and that reflects a, a later stage of life so mm. in spanish schools you're no matter what age you are this is even at the later stage of of schooling um you eat together everyone does mm. but not only are you just eating eating together you're eating good nutritious food as well you know you're eating things that from the land because you know a lot of things there are from the land anyway we, they produce so much in spain but you're, you're eating things that you, you know are, are, are real vegetables and, you know, this is rice and this is lentils, you know, all of those things. And kids are exposed to that at an early age. And I say that relates later on in life because so, and I was shocked by this as an adult, so many of my Spanish friends um, will go out for food together still and, and actually have a collective meal, but on a weekly basis, you know, with five, six, seven, eight friends. But that is, I mean, sit down and we eat together but we're not just eating fish and chips we're eating like food you know paella or you know or tapas whatever but it is a communal thing there is a big you know uh social event here like this is connection you know we're eating together we're laughing i think i've lost john again ah <laughs> oh, this is my internet baby
Josh. Sorry about that, guys. I'm not sure what happened there. My internet went. Is that me or you, do you reckon? No, it's me. My, my internet completely cut out for some reason. They're, uh, they're listening to us. You went, you were going on one again. I know. Can you believe it? They, the, the universe doesn't want me to talk about these things. <laughs> no. But, but just to summarize what I was saying was that I think that the relationship uh, with food starts at an early age, and I think it's important to, to have it from the start. And that's reflected in European gatherings in the way they gather and eat food together. I think, you know, and the respect they have for food, I think that reflects from an early age of how they're treated in school. So, yeah, and it's the, exactly, it's the culture, isn't it? It's the culture they're brought up and it's a wonderful thing. Like, it's, yeah, it's a wonderful thing. Like when they, you see the children, the family all together. And I guess we can only do that in our homes. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, it would hopefully that, that changes and less, less egg and chips and, and you know, <laughs> okay so maybe we should um if anyone does have it there's a few people listening if anyone does have any questions you're more than welcome to pop them in the chat if that's all right with john for a moment and you know we'll answer anything if there's nothing then it's also fine but you know just in case you know might as well acknowledge people who are there yeah okay that's easy <laughs> you have anything else to say john no, no. I think we've we've covered quite a lot, Josh. We have indeed. Chatting with you, man. No, it's been really nice. So, um, you know, oh, okay, cool. No, no problem, no problem. Um, you know, once we're out of lockdown, I hope that people can go and eat at the restaurant again. You know, whenever that is. Um, yeah, I'm guessing you've got some great ideas. Sorry. Yeah, let's hope so. Let's hope so. Yeah, we will be back open. Um, yeah, no, just just I'll start like in the next few weeks or months. Start talking with Liam, and we start looking at what we're gonna do. But yeah, it's we don't change too much. It's, it's, you know, we just yeah, need good to the message. You know? So um, just to because obviously this is gonna be online. Just to remind people. Uh, where they can find the restaurant and stuff just quickly on whether that's social media for the future or the website. Um, you could just inform people quickly where that is. Yeah. So website food by John Lawson.com or, um, Instagram again, food by John Lawson. Uh, my own personal lunch is uh, personal. Um, Insta is food health coach. And then, um, yeah, so, uh, everything, everything's on there. So you'll find us there. Good stuff, John. Well, uh, really nice chatting to you, mate. Yeah, you too, Josh. Hope As you enjoy, enjoy the rest of this weekend uh, in the garden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't break a back in there. <laughs> and um, maybe soon we can get Jack on here and we'll talk all together. Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be brilliant. That'd, yeah. Good. That'd be good. I'll talk to him. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, thanks so much, John. Thanks, Josh. Have a good rest of the day.